welcome to America with an accent that this week will focus on English as a second language. With COVID-19 in the picture, a natural question would be how do you expect a child to learn English as a second language when there is such little interaction, social and academic interaction? What is the impact of COVID-19 on English language learners? We took our concern to the Nebraska Department of Education and here comes a general picture on how is English as a second language taught here in Nebraska, changes that COVID-19 brought about, as well as some advice for parents on how to help their children. This is indeed America with an accent. Although located in the heart of the United States, 7% of Nebraska's 1.9 million population is foreign born. In a nutshell, there are over 23,000 English learners or English as a second language students from kindergarten to grade 12 or last year of high school in the Nebraska public school system. Approximately 116 separate languages other than English are spoken by ESL students throughout Nebraska, with 69% of them speaking Spanish, followed by Arabic, Korean, Russian and Vietnamese, also well-represented languages. Most of ESL students are in elementary school, especially in kindergarten. The Omaha Public Schools is the largest school district in Nebraska and has the largest number of ESL students. Allison Olson is Title III Director and LPA 21 Coordinator with the Nebraska Department of Education. And Ann Hubble is an English Learner Specialist also with the Nebraska Department of Education. How was English as a second language taught in the Nebraska school before COVID-19? I would like to understand that process, please. Go ahead, Ann. Okay, so what, like, I think there are lots of different school districts in Nebraska and they do different programming depending on their size, depending on the number of, of uh, teachers that they have that can support their population, depending on the resources that they have. And so what it looked like prior to COVID was we probably had some classes that were pull out that students would go to an ELL teacher or an ESL teacher to receive their English instruction for a portion of their day. And then they would be with their regular classes the other parts of the day. There are some that those students are in the regular classes throughout their entire day with someone coming in to provide supports for them. And then there are some that are called sheltered classes where the teachers may have an endorsement in their content area as well as in teaching English as a second language. And they can deliver the content through language acquisition processes and that's called sheltered instruction. I've heard about the pull out and it's, a, it's, it's something that I'm familiar with. I had never heard about the shelter program you said, is that what it is called? So uh, help me understand here, the teacher speaks both languages? Um, not necessarily both languages. We have strategies that we use and the teacher is equipped with the strategies that promote language acquisition. And so the classes that are sheltered are focused on their content, social studies or science or math, or language arts, but the students receive the supports to understand the content using these strategies of second language acquisition. And when you say pull out, how, if I am a parent and I send my child to school, can you please describe to me how is he going to learn English as a second language just in a day? How, how does that work? So if a student is at a beginning stage just learning English, they may have more classes that are focused on language acquisition, developing the language of English in order to access the content. If they have more language, but they still mm -hmm. need some supports, they may only go to an ESL or ELL classroom one time during their day. The other time would all be with, you know, all of the students. Would you okay. agree, Allison? I would. Uh, you asked about a pullout program. And so for districts that use a pullout program, ideally the school tries to find time in the student's day when that student can meet with the ESL teacher to work on their English and not miss important content that's happening in the general education classroom. Um, it's it's not uncommon, maybe during a writing period while the other students are writing, that, that the English learners will meet with an ESL teacher and they also focus on writing. Um, 
I think schools try to avoid pulling students out. Um, we never want to take away students' recess time or PE. Oh, kids are assessed in terms of their English ability, speaking ability. So there is a placement test at the beginning. How does that work? Yes, um, it begins with the registration process. And so when a parent enrolls a child in a new school, they fill out paperwork. One of the registration forms is called the home language survey. And so there are three questions that are asked to determine what language is spoken in the home, what language does the student speak. And based on that information, if the parent answers anything other than English, then that indicates that we do want to give the student a screener assessment to see if they qualify as an English learner. Okay. And there are many districts in Nebraska who use um, what's called the ELPA 21 screener. Um, there are some districts who use a different screener and that's okay. It does have to meet certain criteria, but they can use a different screener. And so parents are then notified that either their child qualifies as an English learner and will receive additional supports or that the student is proficient in English and doesn't need those supports. When my son, my first son, we have two sons and my husband and I were both immigrants. When my first son entered school, he went through the screening process. We were just all ears because we didn't know the system. So we were learning along with our kid. You said that it's different for different districts. They apply different programs. Are those programs the same for all levels? I mean, for all school levels? There are differences by grades, really more by building level. So you have elementary, then you have middle. Usually that's about grade six through eight. And then you have high school. When students enroll in a district and if they stay in the district, it's not uncommon for students to take anywhere from five to seven years to become proficient in English. So if you think of those students who start at kindergarten, a lot of times by the time they leave elementary, they have already acquired English and we consider them proficient and then they're, they're called former English learners, but they're really no longer English, English learners. Was technology involved in teaching English as a second language before COVID-19? I would say yes, um, mm -hmm. but again, it varies by district and even by teacher. I was with Lincoln Public Schools last year and when and this all happened, some of our teachers already had the technology going, their students were familiar, they, they didn't miss a beat. Other teachers hadn't done that, they were, they were catching up and kind of getting going. So one of the things they all evaluated at the very end, the teacher said, we need to use technology so that students become familiar with the tools and then they're able to move forward. So okay. I would say technology has been available, but not all teachers were using it to the same degree. But now I think all teachers recognize there's a value in helping our students learn these tools in case something would happen so they could continue to do their work at home. Okay. And now to summarize the pre-COVID-19 era, uh, how successful, how would you rate the ESL program in the state of Nebraska? How successful was the ESL program in the state of Nebraska so public school system? Yeah, um, I think it's pretty, it is pretty effective. Um, overall, we do see students who make gains um, close to probably 50% um, or more of every of English learners are making expected gains. And so there are a lot of good things happening while there's still room to grow. I would agree with that. And I was maybe at a smaller level, but districts do evaluate and look at the number of students that they have who are meeting proficiency every year. But not just that, they're making growth. You know, we talk about the five to seven years for students to acquire academic language. We want to see growth occurring each and every year. When we talk about academic language, um, it is much more difficult than conversational English. So we'll have students who can, you know, say good morning and we can carry on a conversation with them. They, but frequently they still need more time to learn the vocabulary that they will need in their, in their more difficult classes, science, yeah. social studies, math, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I don't know anything about math. When my aunt, well, 
<laughs> it's so different to terminology, you know, even the name of theorems, I'm like, uh, I, I say them differently. So, yes, yes, you are absolutely right. You're absolutely right there. And one technical question before we move to COVID and when COVID hit, hit, the, hit us. Uh, if, my, if I immigrate, the family immigrates in the middle of the year, and there is a, a, a school year, a school age child. Do you accept that student in the middle of the year? Do you admit that student in the middle of the year? Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, we want, as we would encourage parents as soon as they get housing, um, the school should be their next stop. We want their student enrolled in school as soon as possible. Okay, so it doesn't matter, no or not English, you just go to school. It's January yes. 1st or it's March 1st or May, May 1st. 1st. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, now let's move to COVID-19. <laughs> you mm -hmm. touched on it a little bit and you said that technology was available, but it wasn't widely used as a, as a resource from all teachers. Now, what was the main problem that you identified or one of the main problems that you would identify in ESL pre-COVID and the main problem that you identified during the spring semester? Not all of our families had the access to internet. And so that was one of the first things that I think Lincoln Public Schools and I know a lot of other schools, we purchased some hotspots, we worked with the city to see how we could um, provide some supports and, and get this internet service to all of our households. Mm -hmm. um, so, so those were, were big things. Students and families needed the internet access at home okay. in order to be able to participate. Um, we needed to have that good communication so they understood what was going on and, and that was much more difficult once we were all you know, remote. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that, we, that was kind of an interesting thing our teachers found out uh, Again, those teachers that had practiced some of these skills with their students, those students were more comfortable, they were able to get on, they kind of knew what to maneuver. Um, but Zoom, doing something like this, some of the students of all ages were embarrassed and didn't want their picture on the screen, or they didn't have a quiet place at home and they had lots in their family and so it was a noisy and they didn't want to participate. Now we moved from uh, spring semester that uh, we were not as prepared and now we, tra we, uh, we transition into fall semester. And first of all, I would like to know, do you have any data? Does, uh, do all ESL students have access to technology or are getting lessons of English as a second language as we speak in the state of Nebraska? My hope would be all learners in the state of Nebraska are receiving instruction. It doesn't have to be on technology. There are some resources that we've shared that have been packets um, because if the family just didn't have the internet despite everybody's effort, we still didn't want instruction to stop. And so um, it should be continuing. And um, if there are families that are concerned that their students are not receiving English learner services, they should contact their school district. And if they don't have any luck there, then they should contact the Nebraska Department of Education. All students and families did have the choice, just like all students. Um, I think that if they were uncomfortable and they didn't feel like they were able to return to school, they could choose to do a remote learning. But I think a lot of students have chosen it. My experience is students wanted to be back in school, many of them. And so the teachers that I've talked to they have most of their classes back. It's just maybe a few who are choosing to do the remote, but they're all getting instruction. Can you please tell me how is ESL taught right now to a student that has chosen remote learning as his uh, option this semester? I can say just a couple of ideas, but I, again, it might be different for lots of different situations, okay. depending on the resources that they have available. Um, one of the things that our teachers talked about right away was really making sure students were safe and knew what they needed, you know, meeting their needs and anything. Also building those relationships so that they get to know who the members of their class are, even if it's through Zoom or some other kinds of activities. So I know that the teachers that are working with those students who are at home or remote are working on still making good relationships, getting them, getting to know them. And then there are resources that some of our teachers are pretty amazing. The things that they put together 
and they've developed some abilities for them to speak and then to listen to themselves on you know devices and then they can do their reading and they can do their writing okay. and then there's interaction that the teacher can respond right away and see how they're doing. Question, my child didn't meet the academic goal because of COVID, lack of uh, technology or other reasons. Does my child need to repeat this year? No student should have to repeat the entire school year because of spring closure. The high school level students do have to earn credits to graduate. And so if students weren't able to complete a course because school closed, so now that school is starting again, that student should have the opportunity to repeat that one course and make credit toward graduation. Um, they shouldn't have to repeat courses that they've already completed. Districts have to be very strategic about saying, what were the most important things that students missed? So we can help them learn that while recognizing that we're in a new school year and the learning for this school year has to go on. We can't okay. just back up. Yeah. All right. So basically, will be an incorporation of some of the most important topics that were not covered the previous year, the previous semester. The teacher will be incorporating them in yes. this year's curriculum. Um, yes. Okay. That yes. makes sense. We thought so. <laughs> we and, and with that, we really want to provide for some individual opportunities. If one student missed a piece of critical learning, then let's find a time to help that one student get caught up, not try to teach it to everybody who may know it already. Okay. Well, Ms. Hubble, you said that you worked closely last year with Lincoln Public Schools, and you were right there. You were right there where everything was happening. Now, what do you anticipate that as the biggest challenge for ESL teachers this semester, this fall? One thing that I've heard and so I still have connections with some of the teachers. They are trying to do everything. So they are trying to teach to their students who are in their classroom, and they are trying to teach to those students who are remote learners simultaneously. So they are trying to engage those students that are at home remote learners, as well as engage, and they don't have the abilities to do some of the cooperative learning that we used to always do because of protocol. They have to be safe. They have to make sure students are social distanced. The students are wearing masks. The yeah. teachers are wearing masks. Students need to be able to see expressions and to be able to understand. Students need to be able to talk to each other. Those are challenges. Um, and when I talk to the teachers, those were the things. Um, all teachers that I talked to felt like they were working 10 times harder to be mediocre at best. How can a parent of an ESL student help in this situation? Because it may so be that the parent himself or herself is not able to mm -hmm. speak English that well. Mm -hmm. How can we help our child? Well, I think we'll both have some ideas. I would say first and foremost, um, the, ch the parent just sending the message to the child of how important education is, and that's done in any language. Um, when the parent continues to work with the child in their own language, it does support the language development. We never want students to forget their home language. And so okay. uh, parents can continue to read to their child, to talk to their child, to count with their ch child, to do the things that they would do in any language. Um, have the, make sure that the child knows where to get help and ask for help. And if the parent needs more information, um, to please reach out to the school. And I would agree, and I would just, again, echo that the, the parents reaching out to the school just to make sure they understand the expectations, they understand the goals, they have a good sense of where their son or daughter is in their learning, and so they know that, okay, they're, they're on track, or this is what they're doing. We all know sometimes students will come home and say, yeah, I didn't have any homework today, or everything's just fine, and the parents are not quite sure if that's always accurate. And so just that good collaboration between the parents and the teachers, and if they don't speak the language, schools have resources to make sure okay. they can provide that support and help them here. And we're talking about interpreters here. So if you're not the able to do all these. Okay. Yes, yes. Right. And most, most districts anymore also do have um, digital resources, whether it's grade books, ways that parents can go online 
and check on their child's progress. And frequently those can be accessed in multiple languages. Another question, and this, concern, this concerns that social part of language, uh, the kids are missing a lot. The, those kids that have chosen the online or didn't have any other choice, but the remote learning, uh, they're missing a lot on the social interaction, friend-to-friend -friend inter interaction, and that is very important. How would you replace that part of language learning process that you're gonna be missing this semester? I would hope that teachers are maybe creating a buddy system. So if we have two or three virtual students, they can connect virtually and practice their language and oh, talk to okay. one another. I would put a plea out to the students and I would really work with the students and talk to them about their own goals. Five things that you're gonna to do today that you used your language in some way. You know, like you talk to someone um, in your family using English, or you you uh, get on Zoom and you have a conversation with some friends in English, or you listen to something in English and then you try to understand and explain it. So I would I would reach out to the students and say, and this could be something a teacher could do with the students, but those goals and those challenges. Well, thank you both for being with us today. I bet that there is a lot of information, useful information that parents like me would, uh, would appreciate a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really, and um, feel free to refer anyone to our website or um, our phone numbers, our email addresses are on there and we would be happy to connect with any parents who have concerns or questions. Absolutely, thank you. This was America with an accent. I hope to see you again here on KPAO TV or online at www.newamericansmedia.com. Thank you for watching. I am Enkela Vebio.